Did you all know that one of the most profound, powerful verses in Scripture is also one of the most simple? It's famous for being the shortest verse in the Bible. Who knows what it is? Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. Now, sometimes I consult other versions of the Bible, not just a concordant. I, I rarely ever use just a concordant. But the New World Translation, which is actually famous for being the main version that Jehovah's Witnesses use, this version renders that same passage, passage. Jesus gave way to tears. Odd way of phrasing it, right? Here's why I think that's so profound and powerful, for me anyway, is it shows the humanity of Christ on a level that most other verses really don't. Gave way to tears. Now, we're from Johnstown, Pennsylvania. If any of you know about Johnstown, PA, it's famous for one thing, the flood that happened. And the story behind the flood, I won't go into a lot of detail, but the flood was managed by a lot of tycoons at the time, um, like Andrew Carnegie, and there were all these threats of it going out any time. The flood was always, or the dam was always in disrepair. And eventually, one fateful day, the dam gave way. It broke. And all this flooding, this devastation came through and just destroyed so much property and so much life. And there are all these museums in our town for it. So I read that verse in here. I read, Jesus gave way to tears. And I think about this dam giving way and all this water, right, gushing out. The reason the passage is so powerful, beyond just showing the humanity of Christ, the fact that he was acquainted with all of our sorrows, all of our griefs, all of our joy, he experienced every human emotion that we do. He was human. But beyond that is the fact that before Jesus cried, Jesus knew that he would be raising Lazarus again. So a little context. In chapter 11 of John, what happens is Jesus and his disciples get word that from Mary and Martha, they end up getting sent word that Lazarus is dying, that he's sick. And Jesus says, well, we're going to hang out here a couple days longer. They don't go right away. And eventually, after those couple days are through, Jesus says, let's go back to Judea. Let's go see Lazarus. And he says, I'll wake him from his sleep. And the disciples are confused when they say, well, Master, first of all, you know, the Pharisees are after you. And last time you were there, you almost got stoned to death. So they try and prevent him from going. And he says, I need to wake him from his sleep. And they say, well, surely if he's just sleeping, you know, he's... then it says, Jesus spoke plainly, Lazarus is dead. So he gets there. And Mary comes to Jesus, and Mary and Martha are distraught, and they say, Lord, Lazarus has died. And Jesus talks to them about having faith, and that he is the way, the truth, and life, and any man who believes in him will be raised. And she says, yes, I understand that they will be raised on the last day. So she gets the concept of resurrection, and Jesus says, no, today. <laughs> It's going to happen now. And then before they even go, Jesus tells his disciples, I am glad this has happened, for this will be proof to you that I'm who I say I am. Right? So God did this, and Jesus knew God did this, for the purpose of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, his greatest miracle, to prove that he was who he said he was. So Jesus has no doubts at all about the future in store for Lazarus. But yet, when Jesus is told that Lazarus has died, and he says, go and show me where you placed him, he cries, okay? Now, I'm going to share a personal story about myself that I've never told anybody. Nobody. You all are privileged first hearers of this, okay? <laughs> um, I've had three of my four grandparents. I have one grandmother. My mom's mom is still alive, and she's getting up there in age, and she has a long history of long-living females, so hopefully she'll have a ways to go. But my two grandfathers and my dad's mom, my fraternal grandmother, are dead. So my dad's dad, uh, we called him, his name is Bernard, we called him Grandpa Bernie. 
He died in 1995 at the age of, it was 68 or 69. He was born in 26. Um, and then my second grandfather, my mom's dad, who was born in 29, he died in 2003. And then my dad's mom, my grandma Mary. So the grandfather who died in 1995, this was his widow, she died in 2013. So nearly six years ago now. And when my grandpa died, I was 11 or 12 years old at the time. And I remember I wasn't allowed to go to the hospital when he was dying because my parents saw at the time that it was morbid and I shouldn't be witnessing that as a kid. That night back at our house, my grandma was there, her husband had just died. And I remember sitting in my grandma's lap. I was almost a teenager at the time and I was trying to be strong, you know. I have kind of a grasp on these things. And I, I remember thinking to myself, I haven't cried. Is there something wrong with me? You know? And out of nowhere, completely uncontrollably, unexpectedly, shockingly, I start bawling like a baby in her arms. And I, we were sitting in a rocking chair. My grandma held me like a baby and rocked me. And I looked up at her and she had this stalwart look on her face. Like she was just trying to keep it together for my sake. It was her husband who died. My father was the second of three boys. They had three boys and then three girls, six kids total, and several miscarriages too. That's interesting, three boys and then three girls. And my mom was one of five kids. They're baby boomers, you know. Um, now, so that happened with my first grandfather. I was, I was younger, but I was surprised. When my second grandfather died, which is around the time that my wife and I got engaged, um, I remember sitting in the hospital, and the whole family's gathered around the hospital bed. And he had a really aggressive skin cancer that took over most of his face. And they had to, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to get too graphic here, but they had to graft skin from his leg and put it over his face. And there were hairs growing from it because it was from his leg, from his thigh, you know. And, um, and it smelled. And he had a tracheotomy tube put in on one of his last surgeries. Couldn't breathe, couldn't talk. And I, I offered to go and take care of him in the nursing home through the nights. And I remember having to go and get the nurses a bunch of times and say, you've got to come and suction out because, you know, blood, mucus, all this stuff would build up. And um, my grandpa and I loved to play chess. So we'd sit there through the night and we'd play chess and he had a hard time sleeping. I was working two jobs at the time and doing this in addition to that. And um, I remember one night he, he had a little, a little whiteboard and he, he'd write a little, you know, one or two words on that at a time for me to tell me what he needed or what he wanted. You know, like he'd write, want to play, and that was my cue, let's play chess. Or one night he said, walk. He wanted me to take him on a walk through the hallway of the nursing home. We got back to the room one night and I said, all right, Grandpa, I, I got to go. And I got to get to work. This was daybreak. And he walked up to me and he was crying and he gave me a hug. And it was, it was a really special moment. When my grandma died in 2013, and my grandma was the sweetest lady I've ever known. Grew up on the farm, the only girl of many kids, and the oldest one, so she had a really motherly nature, great cook, you know. Um, we'd come over to her house, the house was never clean, <laughs> you know, because she was one of those, the house is lived in, it's not always going to be clean type of people. And I'd come in and she'd go, oh, come here, you know, and give me a big hug. Come here, let me make you some food, and you know, oh, no, you haven't had enough, and she, that kind of lady. When that grandma died, I was closer to her than I was any of my other grandparents. When she died, I didn't shed a tear. I don't know why I didn't shed a tear. Not too long ago, one of our cats died. His name was Mo. And we watched him die. It was completely sudden. My daughter came running down crying, and she said, she said, Dad, Mo's not walking right. His back feet are dragging. And I looked this up. 
And I had just had him into the bed a couple days before because he'd lost weight and they said everything seemed fine. And it turned out he had a saddle thrombus. He had a blood clot in, I think down near his spine and it cut off circulation to his hind legs so he couldn't walk right. And we tried to move him and he couldn't, you know, he'd flop around and he'd, he'd howl out the little he could. And he, he had a seizure because of a clot, I think, and his, his rear leg was kicking up in the air. And we're watching it, and my wife, who's not even much of an animal lover, she just starts crying. And my kids are going, oh no. And I hold him in my arms, and his head just sinks back. And we go outside out back to bury him. And Clyde said a little something and shed some tears. And I went out later that night, and I came back home. And I sat in the car in our driveway, and I cried like a baby. I don't think anyone in their house even knows that. I cried like a baby over a cat. I didn't shed a tear for my grandparent that I was closest with, my grandma Mary. But I cried about a cat. And I cried about both my grandpas. Now here's my point. Our response to grief is shocking and surprising and overwhelming. And we need help through it. Okay? Now what I'm going to be talking about today, and by the way, before I get into this, I want to pass this around because I think it's important. One of my favorite things about meeting new people is hearing their stories. I love that. Whenever we have new visitors, I always want to ask about them, you know, because there's so much about each of our lives that's unique and special because God's written every one of our stories, like Clyde said. And it's hard to really know a person if you don't know a lot about them, right? So much of the communication we have is superficial. It's just surface level, right? I just told you an intimate story about my grandparents and a cat, but I want you to see what they actually looked like, okay? These were really important people in my life. And I want you to, and I wrote on here, you know, dad's dad, dad's mom, I wrote the years that they lived. Um, so I want you to see them. Um, it takes me way too much time to talk a lot about each of them. I'd love to do that. But, you know, I never had the privilege of meeting Clyde's dad. And Clyde said many times that his dad was the greatest man he ever knew. And I wish so bad I would have. But I know that I probably know him somewhat because I know Clyde. And because Clyde emulates his father. And he talks about how loving his parents were. And, I asked him, you know, what does it feel like to not have parents anymore? Both my parents are still living. And he said, I felt like an orphan. Raise your hand if your parents are both gone. It, do you feel that way? Do you feel like an orphan? Or did you for a time? And did you need comforted through that? Okay, so I'm going to start over here. I'm going to pass this around as I talk. Um, anyway, so, so John 11... The chapter about Lazarus, in this one simple verse, it shows us the humanity that Jesus had. That, and, and, and it shows us that death, just like scripture says, is an enemy. You know, I can't help but think that part of my response to the cat we had dying, part of it, I think, was seeing what my kids had to go through, witnessing it. But a lot of it, I'm convinced, was seeing him actually die. Right? Death is an enemy. And if you go to a funeral, if you hear somebody or a pastor say, so-and-so is in a better place right now, you know, and trying to give words of comfort, that's nonsense yeah. right now. Death's an enemy, and death's the last enemy that's going to be, that's going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. But I think the reality is, if we're being honest with ourselves, and I'm guilty of this myself, that's why I wanted to teach on this today. Most of us have a really hard time knowing the best way to go about comforting others in their time of need. Yes. You agree? Yes. It's really difficult. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. If you're not going through it, let's be honest. It's easy to push it aside and say, you know what, I feel really bad for them, but they're going through it, not me. I'm okay. I'll deal with that if and when it happens to me, right? But God has called us to do the exact opposite of that. He's called us as members of the body to be there for each other, especially our fellow body members. Right? 
And how does a body work? How do I, when you go blind, what happens to your other senses? They compensate. They're enhanced. So what happens when one of our fellow body members, a, another believer, is in distress and is in need? What is it our job to do? It's to take that burden upon ourselves and to help them through it, right? Okay, so we often fear when other people are going through distress that if we attempt to comfort them and show them compassion, we fear that we're going to do more harm than good, don't we? Yes. We tend to mostly ignore the sufferings of others a lot of the time. Yes. Yeah. When we need help, we understand the importance of comforting the passion all too well. You know, I remember the first time my car ever broke down, and I was on the side of the road. I thought, I'll be honest, I thought every single person that passed by me, what a jerk. I did. Right? I don't think I would have that reaction now with the understanding I do of God. But years ago, I'm talking like 17 years old, you know, I remember thinking every person passed, you jerk! Right? And then finally somebody stopped and, wow, what compassion. This guy doesn't even know me, and he's willing to take time out. Yet I realized how many times have I passed by people on the road who are broken down and not even given it a second thought. It revealed a lot more about my own heart to me than it did theirs when I thought, when I thought about it in the right context, right? Right. Yeah. So I want to talk to you about the biblical model for showing comfort and compassion to others especially when dealing with loss of life, okay? The most devastating. Now, these principles I'm going to go over generally apply to most situations, and I'll kind of go over some exceptions to these things. But um, I'm going to go over some verses, some biblical stories. We're going to go over some Greek words, and then I'm going to get into a practical guide for how to go about in a godly way Showing compassion to others. So if you don't have a pen and paper, if you can get one, it'd be really good. Because I'm going to be telling you things, and it'd be ideal to actually write these things down, right? Because I don't have them up here. But even if I did, it'd be good for you to write it down so you can kind of take it home. And... What's that? I'll show it here. Yeah. So you can take it home and, and study it a little bit. <laughs> Grandpa Bernie. Grandma Mary, these are my dad's parents, my grandpa Bud, my mom's dad, and Mo. Uh, Mo Mo. Yeah. Um, okay. So, story of Job. We all know the story of Job. Do you know Job's actually the oldest book in the Bible? Oldest book. And, um, so Job goes through all this calamity. His livestock, he's a wealthy man, first time. His livestock, his ten children, are all taken from him. And then in addition to that, the adversary gives him sores, boils to cover his whole body. He's in excruciating pain, to the point where his wife says, curse God and die. <laughs> Just say... I'm done, that's it, and die. And Job does get to a point where he said, he compares light and darkness, and he says, let the day of my birth be darkness, as if it had never been. He's that miserable, okay? Now, we can, not, we can learn a lot about what I'm going to talk about by studying the story of Job, because his friends, he has three friends initially, there's a fourth one that chimes in later, but Job's friends do something initially that's amazing, and then they get into doing something that's awful for the majority of them. Here's what they did that was amazing, and I'm going to read it. Job chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. And three companions of Job got to hear of all this calamity that had come upon him, and they proceeded to come, each one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite. So they met together by appointment to come and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they raised their eyes from far off, they did not then recognize him. And they proceeded to raise their voice and weep and rip each one his sleeveless coat apart and toss dust toward the heavens upon their heads. And they kept sitting with him on the earth, listen, 
seven days and seven nights, and there was no one speaking a word to him, for they saw that his pain was very great. So here's what I want you to notice about this. Job's friends, they all live in different areas. Can you imagine how hard traveling would have been in those days? The weather conditions, right? They come together by appointment. What does that mean? This is a planned get-together, right? With a planned purpose, a goal. The goal being to comfort Job. They get there, and he's so bad they don't even recognize him. And then his pain is so great. Imagine that, losing everything you have. Your children, your babies, all dead. They sit on the earth with him. They're on the dirt, on the ground. A whole week, seven days and seven nights, and they don't say a word. Silence. Do you imagine that? But why? Scripture tells us why. Because they saw that his pain was too great. Sometimes silence is exactly what's warranted, isn't it? Have you ever been distraught and any words someone tries to say to you are empty and ring hollow? There's a time when the words are needed and they're comforting. But sometimes your pain is so great that you just need people to be with you, but you don't even say a thing. Have you experienced that? I have. Proverbs 17, 28 says, Even someone foolish, when keeping silent, will be regarded as wise. Anyone closing up his own lips as having understanding. You know, you can be in a whole room full. Keith's laughing because last night, <laughs> last night, Keith and I had a discussion and we were in the company of the family. And we got carried away. And, and both of us. And it ended up getting to the point where everyone else in the room was left out. And it was wrong. You know, we both regret it and we both apologized. And, um, and you know, it's because we weren't taking these bits of wisdom and new advice, you know, staying silent. We want to talk. We want to share our thoughts. We want to seek out truth. But if you're in a, a room with a room full of people and there's a guy over there in the corner who's not saying a thing, he could be an idiot, right? He could not know much of anything, but he's going to appear to be wise. You know, he's quiet. He's going to seem reflective, right? Proverbs 27, verse 9 says that the sweetness of one's companion, friend, due to the counsel of the soul, makes the heart rejoice. Okay? Romans chapter 12. Now, I'm going to be reading verses 10, 13, and 15. So all the verses in between there are important. But listen to these. In brotherly love, have tender affection for one another. In showing honor to one another, take the lead. Some versions say outdo one another. Share with the saints, with believers, according to their needs. Follow the course of hospitality. Listen to this. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Mm -hmm. Is it always easy to weep no. if someone else is weeping? No. No. <laughs> right? I can say there have been plenty of times when People I care deeply about have been going through something really hard, and I don't actually shed tears. I, I may feel that way, but I'm, I'm not actually doing it. Paul says, weep with those who weep. Chapter 15 of Romans, 1 through 2 and verse 7, says, We who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those not strong, and not to be pleasing ourselves. Let each one of us please his neighbor in what is good for his upbuilding or edification. Welcome one another just as Christ welcomed us. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Now this is a little, we're going to talk about this verse here in a little bit. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. You're probably asking, what rule does that have to do with your message, Steve? We'll talk about it. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of tender mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those 
in any sort of tribulation through the comfort with which we ourselves are being comforted by God. For just as the sufferings for Christ abound in us, so the comfort we get also abounds through Christ. Galatians 6, 2. Go on carrying the burdens of one another and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Ephesians 4, 29. Let a rotten saying not proceed out of your mouth, but whatever saying is good for building up, as the need may be, that it may impart what is favorable to the hearers. Almost through the verses, Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Do nothing out of contentiousness or out of egotism, but with lowliness, humility of mind. Consider others superior to you, keeping an eye not in personal interest upon just your own matters, but also in personal interest upon those of others. And Hebrews 13, 16, do not forget the doing of good and the sharing of things with others, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Now, that Hebrew passage is interesting. The King James Version translates this word here, which the Greek word is koinonia, as communicate. Listen to what Strong's defines the word as meaning. Koinonia. Partnership, participation, social intercourse, fellowship. Does that sound like just communication? Sounds like a lot more than that to me. It's active, right? It's intimate. So other versions will properly use share with others instead of communicate with others. Hebrews 13, 16. Okay. Now, a closely related Greek word, which is translated as distributing in Romans 12, 13, this is koinonia, means to share with others. And again, the sharing is sacrificial. When we share something with other people, we're giving something up, aren't we? Okay? That's important. Counsel from Proverbs 27, 9 is etza in Hebrew, which means advice, plan, or purpose. Again, this is active. The Greek word for comfort, parakaleo. Listen to this. The Greek word for comfort means to call near, to invite, invoke, beseech, desire. Again, there's something very intimate about this. Paul calls God the God of all comfort. He tells us the comfort with which you've received, now go and impart to others in the body. Welcome or receive, proslambano in the Greek, means to take by the hand or to receive into one's home. Now understand, Hebrew and Greek language, and Hebrew especially, the language was oftentimes figurative and symbolic, and they would say things in the most extreme sense they could, right? Like if the moon was darkened, they wouldn't say the moon's turned red. They would say the moon has turned to blood. Yeah. That's the way the languages were used. So these are special meanings. We hear a word like welcome, and we think, oh, okay, yeah, you're, you're welcoming. It means to take by the hand or to welcome into one's home, to receive. To bear, B-E-A-R, to bear one of those burdens. The Greek, bastadzo, means remove, lift, carry, or take up. Think about carrying a heavy load. It's hard work, and that's what we're called to do for each other. Affectionate, philostorgos in Greek. Paul says, be kindly affectionate toward one another. The Greek there means cherishing one's kindred, family members, especially parents or children, fondness of natural relatives. That's how we view each other in the body of Christ. And last but not least, well, I'll go give you a couple more. Edify, oikudeme, build up. The Greek here refers to constructing a dwelling with a rooftop. So you can imagine when you edify another believer, or anyone, you're acting like a carpenter, and you're laying a piece at a time, building this structure that's going to end, complete structure that God's working on, right? Covered and protected. 
And the Greek word for compassion, this is probably the most interesting one, means to be moved as one's bowels. The reason for that is that the bowels were thought to be the seat of love and pity. Have you ever had emotions to the point where you feel it in your gut? We all have, I think, many yes. times, right? Whether good or bad. Excitement, fear, right? Okay. So with that knowledge, went over some verses, went over what some of those Greek words mean. I'm going to give you a practical guide of how to go about comforting and showing compassion to others. Again, if you're able to write this down, great. If you're not, that's okay. Or be on a video, I'm sure. Um, now, this isn't really so much part of the list, but this is just something I want to point out in general. Tread lightly when it comes to modern psychological theory. It has run rampant in our modern times. Everyone wants to major in psychology and be a counselor, right? And churches have hired in on-site psychologists for their staff. And the world thinks it has answers to all these things. But God reveals a lot of these answers to us in his word. Yeah. And we're better off consulting what scripture has to say. An example of this is a lady by the name of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross came up with the so-called five stages of grief. Wrote a book about this in the late 60s. And she talked about these five stages and everyone, even today, assumes that these are in fact five stages that everybody who's grieving always goes through, any kind of grief. First, there's, and I don't remember all of them, but it's, you know, like denial and anger and, you know, bargaining and depression and acceptance. I think those are actually the five. I think in order, but maybe not. Um, toward the end of her life, she herself, the one who came up with this theory, said that she was writing about this, and her research was done primarily regarding people who were terminally ill and about to die, not people who were just grieving about anything in general. It was a specific group of studying people. And she said not only that, but sometimes people don't, in her experience, didn't experience all five of the five stages. They may have skipped over one or two of them. And sometimes they experience them in a different order. We're all different, right? So consulting a human source that's attempted to put together some kind of answer is usually not a good idea, okay? So moving on from there. This is the first real bit of advice. Be physically present, if possible, and devote undistracted attention to the person in need. So put your work and other priorities temporarily aside for a time. Okay? Clyde just recently told me, and Andy, were you there? Was it you? He was telling us about a friend in another state who was terminally ill. And he's telling us this story, and he's going to be leaving behind a wife and two small kids. And he said, I need to find a way to get out and see him. He said, I've been talking to this guy for years on the phone, but I've never, I've never met him in person, right? He said, I need to see him. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly what, what should happen if it can. Number two, well, number three in the list, but show physical affection. A simple hug does wonders for people who are hurting. You know, a pat on the back. It's really special. Next, don't, and this is very important. Don't lecture, attempt to reason or make sense of the situation, or give advice, especially early on. Instead, offer comforting words about, Paul's, or, or about God's control and his good plan for our lives and the importance of trusting him. God is in control of everything. He's our perfect, loving father. Everything's in his hands and everything's working out according to good and according to his will. If the situation is dire, silence for a while may very well be necessary. It may be your best option. Okay, so does that all make sense so far? Next, place yourself in the person's position. This seems obvious, but empathize, em, or sorry, empathize with them. Imagine yourself in the same position that the other person's going through and act accordingly. 
You may have even been in the same or a similar situation, in which case you're more capable of speaking to it. Okay. Um, Romans 12 and 15, those chapters really hit home on that point. You know, after Job's friend sat with him silently, Job ends up speaking up. And then they go into these long lectures, these long poetic lectures, and Job's having to defend himself. And they're convinced that he had to have done something wrong and sinful, and that this is his just judgment and punishment from God for whatever crimes he committed. And Job tells his friends, he says, you are miserable comforters. And in another earlier chapter, he calls them worthless physicians. <laughs> Not because they were silent, that was good, but because they're trying to give him all this advice and guidance when he needed it least. He says, and this is in chapter 16, if only your souls existed where my soul is, that is, if only you were in my shoes, I would strengthen you with the words of my mouth and with consolation. Next point, just ask. Someone who's suffering a lot, just directly ask them what they're in need of. Hopefully they'll tell you. you know, if you don't ask, it's hard to know. But oftentimes if you, if you ask, because we don't all respond to hardship in the same way, they're going to tell you how you can help them most. Paul told the saints directly in no uncertain terms, this is what I need from you. I need you to send me money. I need you to prepare for when I come to visit you. I need you to take up a collection. I'm going to be sending so-and-so to you in my stead. Right? He told them exactly what he needed. We need to do that, but if someone else hasn't done it and they're suffering, we need to just ask, what do you need? Next, provide assurance to the loved ones of the person directly suffering. Now, when I say directly suffering, I'm referring to if someone is, for example, terminally ill, they're going to die, and their family's trying to cope with this, and they're trying to cope with it, that person is directly suffering. They're also suffering, and they also need consult for their benefit and for the benefit of the person who's passing away, like a father who's leaving behind a wife and children. Offer real and practical provisions, accommodations, and other supporters you're able, even if it requires sacrifice, like welcoming people into your own home, helping providing them financially, and so on, okay? These things are really hard. But consider having a permanent open door policy at your house, and even setting aside, if you can, some income as you're able, for the sole purpose of supporting other people. That's hard to do. Yes. Okay? It's really hard. But we have to help each other as body members. And when one of us is lacking, the other has to pick up the slack. And by doing that for another, they're going to be in a better position to do it for someone else. Pray for them. Now, when we pray for others, it's not in an effort to change God's mind. Okay? Just as Clyde said, God's will is already set in stone and is unalterable. It can't be changed. So it's important. When we pray for others, we're not praying for God to change whatever his predetermined will is. That's not going to happen. We understand that. But by praying for them, we're keeping them at the forefront of our mind all the time. We're making ourselves continually aware and giving ourselves the right attitude. It helps us to view our fellow body members as interconnected and vital parts. So that when one's lacking, the others work harder. Now, all of that is to say, again, real and practical actions are what matter, not mere sentiment. We need to do more than just sympathize with each other. And go, oh, that's... That's really rough. I feel really bad for him. She's having a really rough time. I feel awful for her. We need to do more. Stay in touch with believers. 
whether they're suffering or not. You know, in our modern age, there's not really much of an excuse to not stay in contact with each other, is there? Between email and phone, Skype, I mean, the list is endless, Facebook. It's real easy to stay in touch if we want to. Now, we here, I'll be the first one to tell you I haven't done a great job of this. Because I don't think I've talked with any of you here since last year's meeting. And I should. We should be continually communicating as much as we can, right? And when we do that, we should ask each other, you know, are you in need of anything? Is there any way that I can help you? We don't know if we don't ask. Don't get together and just have some teaching, have some fellowship, and go about our way. We're interconnected, vital parts of the same body, and we have to help each other. Last thing on my list, timing is crucial. Help others as quickly as possible when you can. Dire circumstances almost always demand immediate action, and no help comes too soon. Okay? Whether it's advice, whether it is financial help, going somewhere to help somebody. I mean, it could be anything. But there's no such thing as help that comes too early, is there? But we can always feel like there's help that's coming too late. Yeah. So when you find out about something, act on it as quickly as you can. Now, beyond just acting quickly, timing's also important when you're actually advising somebody through a situation. And sometimes, when someone is grieving really hard, and maybe silence is warranted in that case. Timing needs to be observed appropriately. You don't just jump in and give advice right away. You wait, you sit with them, you hug them, and after a while, or after they've said something, then it's appropriate. Okay. So I'm going to real quick go over the list again, um, just some of those points so you know. Tread lightly with modern psychology. Don't seek that for the answers to these things. Rely on your fellow body members on the word of God. Be physically present, if possible, whenever you can. Actually be there in person, like Job's friends were. Show physical affection. A hug goes a long way. Don't lecture, attempt to reason or make sense of the situation, or give advice, especially early on. Eventually that will be warranted, but... There's a time for it. Place yourself in the person's position. Empathize with them. Just ask. Ask them, what do you need? How can I help? Provide assurance to the loved ones of the person who's directly suffering. And offer real and practical provisions, even if it's sacrificial, like opening up your home, giving them money. Very important. Pray for them. Stay in touch, and remember that timing is very important. Help others as quickly as you can, and while you're helping them throughout the grieving process, make sure that the timing of what you say, and make sure that what you say is appropriate. Oh, last thing. I want to make sure I, I say this, because earlier I, I brought up... Um, the Proverbs passage about God, bad company, corrupting good character. We're called to be hospitable and to be good to all, right? But we prioritize our body members. We prioritize our fellow body members, each other, when we have a need. I remember when Paul wrote to the saints and said, do these things for each other. He was referring to the saints. Yeah. So if a brother or sister in Christ has a need, focus on that. Focus on helping them. It's not to say that we never help or engage in any kind of fellowship with unbelievers. Okay, But our true fellowship is with our fellow believers. Any questions? Just, just along that line, you know, just 
to reinforce what you said, Paul said, for us to do good unto all men, especially the household of faith. Yeah. Right. yeah that's that prioritizing mm -hmm. yeah. Do good to all men, especially the yeah. household of faith. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're